if you were set to introduce yourselves, we're good to go. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for being here. Um, Namina, you start. Introduce yourself. We're being real this morning. We're both okay. uh, like having our coffee or tea or whatever we're having and allergies and this uh -huh. Hi guys, uh, my name is Navina Forna. I am the author of The Gilded Ones. That, I, I suck at this. It's it's over this shoulder, The Gilded. Anyway, I'm the author of The Gilded Ones, um, which is a young adult novel set um, in um, an African inspired, uh, very patriarchal fantasy land where there's a group of girls who are considered demons because they are stronger and faster than regular people. Um, and they bleed gold. Um, then actual demons come into this world and the humans are like, wait a minute, I think we need these girls to fight them. So they offer the girls a choice, fight or die. My main character decides to fight and in doing so uh, changes her life. Speaking of demons, I have my beloved Thugnificent, uh, Nifi for short, because I can't run it around saying Thugnificent. That's just not, Thug, how are you Thug? No, I can't do that. Uh, so Nifi it is. Um, she is nippy this morning, trying to sleep. Um, so y'all will see little bits of fur um, and just know I'm not, I'm not petting cut and candy, which is what for some reason people thought it is a dog. She is a nippy and she's right here. Um, yeah, so morning all. Awesome. Um, I'm Amy King, A.S. King. I, uh, I, I write young adult novels, middle grade novels, poems, uh, short stories and um, notes to myself all over my office. Uh, so you'll see me pick up post-it notes and when inspiring things are said. And um, let's see, uh, I, I most recently released a Switch, which came out this week, um, which is, uh, uh, I write surrealist fiction for the most part. Um, and my last book, Dig, was uh, won the Michael L. Prince Award, which is still really weird for me to say out of my mouth. Um, but I'm very, very, um, hey, audio. Well, that means you're listening to me read. That's a way to fall asleep on a long haul flight. That's what I do. I listen to my own self, read my own audio books to fall asleep on the way to New Zealand every time it works. Um, but that's what I do. Um, and I've been doing tour this week, talking about emotions, which is why this weird wheels behind me, but I'm just not moving it because I got to talk to a few people again <laughs> next week. So I'm just like, I'm gonna leave it here. Um, but I'm really happy to be here today. I'm especially here to talk, I'm especially excited to talk about writing from experience. And experience. I think it's, it's probably one of my favorite things because people, I don't know, people always ask authors where we get our ideas, right? Now I'm gonna, so we, that's what I, I've been asked this for 15 years. Where do you get your ideas? And that's a fine question. But I always feel like I have such a weird answer because it's like, well, I live in it. And they're like, well, that's, what do you mean? Like, and, and then they'll be like, do you bleed gold? Right? <laughs> You'd be like, no, it's a metaphor. So where did you get your idea for this? Where, where inside of you did this come, did this book come from? I'm going to start okay. with that question. But before you ask that, okay, so in one of your books, does somebody bleed gold? No, no, no. No, okay. that's, I went straight for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was bringing it back around to you. That's just me. I'm. I, it's like. I I have my like oh, that is. And... What a coinky dink. My... <laughs> no, no, no one bleeds gold. It, it is early in the morning, y'all. Okay. We have allergies. We have sneezed so much, but we are here. Um. So, where do I get my ideas from? Well, All no. Right. Like, where did you get? Like, what connected to your experience? What What in your life is? Where did the metaphor for bleeding gold come from? Is there one? Um. Well, not specifically from my experience, but I'll talk about just like the book and how that connects. Sweet. Um, so I got, basically I grew up in Sierra Leone, West Africa at the beginning um, of the decade long civil war. Um, and so I guess from an early age, I've had a really good understanding of violence. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that Sierra Leone is extremely patriarchal. So like, um, but what I always found interesting is that sometimes the worst bits of patriarchy are pitched to you as, oh, this is for your own good, mm -hmm. right? So in Sierra Leone, we have, uh, we have female genital mutilation. 90% of women in Sierra Leone have had this happen to them. It's real, yeah. 90? 90. Ah. It's, real, it's really, really bad. And like, it is so like, it's so ingrained in our culture that it's like, 
your mom and your grandmom and your and your older sister, these are the people who are encouraging you to do it, right? So like my grandmother really wanted it for me um, because, and, and here's the thing, like when I say that people are like, oh my gosh, that's horrifying. But like, you have to think about like, the way people pitch it is that this is what makes you pure. You know, this is what makes you a good woman eligible to marry all these things. Like they will tell you all kinds of nonsense about how it makes you like, okay, I can't go into aggressive details, but they will just tell you all kinds of nonsense that have no founding in biology about how this makes you a better woman, right? And so my grandmother really wanted it for me. My parents were like over my dead body because thankfully they were educated. So I am very lucky to have not had that happen. But I grew up sort of with, with an understanding of violence and, a, and an understanding of how it is perpetuated onto women's bodies. Um, and when I came to America, I thought, you know, America, shining beacon on a hill. I came when I was nine, I was like, oh, it's gonna be better. And then uh, I experienced purity culture here. And like in high school, girls are going to balls with their fathers promising them to keep their virginity. And I was just like, what kind of nonsense is this? Yes. Like, this different from like what's, you know, it's, it's like same thing, like being pitched in such nice ways, but it's the same old BS. Like, and I was just like, wow, you really can't catch a break. And the, the thing about this was that Every time I sort of had these questions, people will always be like, oh, that's just the way it is. That's always, that's the way it's always been. And matter of fact, you're the, uh, you're the problem for asking these questions. So I always felt like, you know, it was me, like I was the problem. And it was only when I went to uh, undergrad that I took women's studies classes and I was like, oh, this really is like, it is what I thought it was. And it's so, it, it, it's, it's, it's horrific. So I decided to write a book about it. Um, so the Gilded Ones, I always tell people, it is the book of my rage because I was fed up and I wanted to, I wanted to explain to other girls like, and to other, and just to basically everyone, what happens when you grow up in a, um, in a patriarchal society, like, you know, how it's structured, what upholds it and who suffers under it. And so that's where the idea came from. It was this real lived experience of living under sort of the worst expressions of patriarchy. And then the ones here, which don't seem as bad. And yet, you know, abortion rights are like slowly dwindling away and all these things. Um, and to circle back to the gold, I wanted to talk about the fact that women's bodies are commodified, meaning we are we are made into objects, right? Like when you look at a woman, it's like, oh, she's this age, this, this attractiveness, this whatever, therefore she is worth this much. Or like, like, you know, when people like, my favorite thing is like when people come at you like from West Africa, oh, so, but what can you cook? You know, like, uh, can you cook cassava leaves? Uh, like, are you trying to date me or are you trying to hire me? You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it's just, it's like all of these things. And I was like, what is the easiest metaphor for this? Make their blood cold. Because that way you see directly that women's bodies, like we are like, like, and femme people's bodies, we are, ob we are objects to like, and it's sad, but that is how people oftentimes view us is, you know, in terms of our function, how can we help other people and how can we stay in our place? And that's all that I was talking about. This was a long and convoluted answer. I there. love your answer. This is the perfect answer. So this is, this is great. You just gave me so many more questions, <laughs> but I'm going to, I'll say to you, like, you know, I'm a 51 year old woman and, and I have been through, like, I remember having my first equal rights amendment pin when 1976, and uh, my mom gave it to me and they didn't ratify it yet. Mm. It's 2021. Um, and it's, it was, you know, the patriarchy was a constant um, topic in my house. And thank God, I'm so glad I was raised with some sort of idea that this isn't normal or this isn't right, that this, this thing that I'm, I'm, I'm being told all the time isn't right. One of the interesting things, I, I wrote a poem the other week and it was about the fact that, you know, in this culture, we're constantly talking about, you know, periods and blood and how that makes us weak. And in actual fact, none of us would exist if it wasn't for periods. Like, why don't people understand that we do bleed gold? 
that's what we it's gold we bleed we bleed gold that's what and so when you said that i was like i know that's not what you were thinking but like the metaphor in my head was like we are gold we are made of gold like we're unbelievable as a, as a species as a, as a, as a, our bodies are insanely awesome and all we've been told since the beginning of time is that we should be ashamed of them they should be smaller they should be this they should be that and it's just constant throwing throwing it at us and now of course i'm in i'm in menopause so it's sort of like oh what's that now i'm useless to the culture i'm a useless person all of a sudden which is really weird um and at the same time people leave me alone a little more now and that's fine i'll take that but uh but it's just sort of it's an interesting life to kind of go through all those different cycles i was talking about how women we're, we're, we're we are it's amazing to be devalued in the same culture where we have to constantly adjust the minute we hit whatever age we have this new thing happening and then every month this new thing happens and it's always a little bit different or a little bit funky or it's oh crap it happened in the middle of a basketball game I have to run straight off the court straight down to the locker room do take care of business and come back up and you know take care of all these things we're constantly taking care then we get pregnant have babies that's that was an insane experience it was freaking awesome freaking awesome but insane and we have to then deal with our bodies that changed things change after that and they change again and then i go through this stuff and this is just bonkers i'm just like it's constant change and we have to be so on the ball and so epic to be able to get through a life as a woman on top of all the bullshit that's handed to us from every angle telling us that all this stuff is wrong I'm like if this is wrong and you believe in god what is his problem what did he do to give me all this i don't understand like because this is happening now. You have to be about to get up and walk away, laugh. <laughs> Don't walk away, laugh right there. It's all good. But this is the truth, right? Like it's the biggest triple, double, quadruple standard in the whole world. And it's, it's, it's to me, I feel like at this point, the patriarchy is snookered, right? It's cornered because there isn't a thing that they can say that's going to actually make sense to back up their, their, their bullshit. And it's, it's brilliant. At the same time, they're still winning. And it really pisses me off <laughs> because they're still running the place. You know, there's still the voice in our head too. Don't feel this way. Don't do that way. Don't act this way. And it's always this voice, usually of a white dude. It's always like Cat Williams, white man voice in my head, um, right? <laughs> That's telling me not to feel a thing. Um, so it's like, it, I love the idea of your book. I have not read your book, but I haven't been able to read for a while. I have some, some brain issues at the moment. So it's just kind of, I can't read anybody. Uh, but I'm dying to because I love the concept. Now I'm gonna, it's it's, and I'm you know I can't imagine what it was like growing up in Sierra Leone at the time you did, um, and to to know violence like that. I was gonna ask you a question. Nick, I was talking to Nick Stone the other night, and she said something super smart because everything she says is super smart. But she said the root of your anger can lead to compassion, and I I connected with that because uh, my last book dig was was you know me still being so angry about the white supremacy and being so angry about where i grew up and how i grew up and not, i mean my, not my folks thank god because my, my my parents are pretty solid not to say not my not my folks we're all if you're white and you're in this country you got what you got and you better you better look at it and figure it out um but i was lucky that that i had the folks i did but seeing what was around me and having this lump on my head from a skinhead and having you know you know grown up in in, in this world i was so angry and my anger never was able to change a racist mind never ever i was never able to to argue or yell or 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 uh, rationalize a racist out of their ideas so i decided that to approach it with compassion in a way and so what I wanted to do and dig is all the different characters. I wanted to approach them with some sort of compassion, even the ones that just make you want to throw up, except for one. There's one guy. Yeah, screw him. So my question is, when it comes to your rage that you talked about, and when it comes to coming up against the patriarchy day after day, after, day after, and it's not going to end. I'm sorry. Now, I'm gonna, you know, it's not going to end. I don't have to tell you that. It's not going to end. It's not going to end for me either. I've got maybe another 25 years on the planet if I'm lucky. It's not going to end. So what I had to do is live in my little bubble and pretend it doesn't happen. And if anybody gets all up in my grill about like being all, I don't know, weird, I can just ignore them or tell them to go and do another thing. But my question is, were you, are you able to find like, where does that compassion come out for you? Where, where does that come out in your life, in your practice, in your writing? Where does it come out? Um, that is a super interesting question. And again, I'm going to have a long winded and circuitous. Do it. I just did that. That's the whole point. Um, and also you will hear like sort of thudding in the background and Niffy is like having a war with my shoe. It's very fascinating. I don't know who's winning at this point, but you know, we're here. Um, so I like, 
I spent my entire 20s, like I spent most of my life extremely angry. Um, there's this rage uh, with being a woman, a black woman, an immigrant, existing in spaces that aren't meant for you that you have and you sort of tap down and you tap because like you know as a black woman if I say I'm angry well you're an angry black woman you know like there's immediately that that idea and so like I had just sort of this quiet rage that existed under the surface that I never talked about but that sort of poisoned me on the inside like I like I spent my whole 20s basically depressed and what I came to discover um sort of like through therapy, through just writing, through like really examining myself was the reason why I was so sad was because I was mad and I never talked about it, you know? So I had to start talking about the things that made me mad in order to feel um, happy, to feel good. And there is where the compassion comes from. I think first have compassion for yourself. Yeah. And to have compassion for yourself is to say, listen, man, really, <laughs> to have compassion for yourself is to, uh, first of all, say the things that you actually want to say and to not, um, what is the word? To not like censor yourself, to not, uh, to not pretend that everything is okay. Um, so like, I think embracing anger leads to compassion because when you embrace anger, like his anger, like to me, anger is a very valuable emotion because it's the emotion that tells you, Hey, something isn't right here. I am feeling, um, I am feeling like unappreciated, unwanted, or my boundaries are being crossed in some way. So I must speak here. Um, and like, examine it or like it just goes back inside and then it becomes sadness and depression and all these things yeah. so you have to have compassion for yourself and compassion for yourself means like defending yourself speaking out saying the things um saying the things that are important that you are not saying because you're afraid you'll make somebody mad or because you're afraid you'll offend somebody and so in the book that is the journey that my main character, Deka, goes through. Deka grows up in this society where she is told at every level that she is beneath, that she is below, that she is not wanted. In fact, she has to go through a ritual of purity in order to prove um, that she is pure there so that she can become a part of her village, which of course, as we all know, that's a condition and love is not conditional like that. The longing is not conditional like that. So she has to go on this journey to sort of ask all these questions that she has been sublimating. And that means discovering her rage, discovering her anger. Um, so that's where the compassion comes in. I think first start with compassion for yourself. First start with asking the questions and saying the things that you want to say. Oh. That was that was a great answer, Naman, and it helped me a lot. I will I will I will just, you know, we're sharing, so I'm sharing. But um, you know, it's funny because I since I was a kid, the reason I, I have this wheel behind me and I talk about emotions a lot is because since I was a kid, I always was like, You're allowed to have these emotions. And people would be like, shh, the way they always do, shh, oh, calm down, or and this is what I've been talking about with people in the last week and and everybody's been told to, you know, and especially girls, especially, you know, women. Um, and one of the people, you know, somebody asked me why I write for young adults years ago. And I'm like, because I'm a woman, we're all, none of us are taken seriously. I feel like we're on the same level. Uh, and people were like, what? And then of course it was a dude. He was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, oh, forget it. You wouldn't understand. Um, you know, <laughs> like, and that's, it's one at of those every things. Level. At every level. Every single level. Like there just isn't, there isn't a level that it doesn't like everything from, like you can be in a hospital having a feeling and the doctor say, you don't feel like that. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, I do, actually. Can I have another doctor? Um, but it's interesting that you say about embracing anger because the one thing I've been, I just, I just got out of a 30-year-long abusive marriage. And that's a weird thing to say as a person who is clearly strong, very open, very, uh, you know, upfront. Um, 
but congratulations to you. I thank you very much. It took it took a lot of strength, and and you know, it, it was very complicated uh, with with children and life and just how things unfolded in the last few years, especially. But thank you for saying congratulations because that is the correct thing to say, and that is why I am got this big old grin on my face. But um, what's interesting about it is that one of the leading experts on abusers, um, because people will say, oh, well, he's abusive because he's drinking or he's abusive because he's got a mental illness. No, actually, it's the other way around. Abuse is its own thing. Here it is. It's basically toxic masculinity and like supercharged patriarchy shit. And um, that's what it is. And but the number one, one of the biggest things that abusers do is they, they don't allow you to, their victims to be angry. And so, which is amazing because of course you're being, you're being messed with so much over and over and over again that all you are is angry, but then you're told that you're not allowed to be angry. And then you just, and so like you eat it and you become like, for me, situationally depressed for sure. Um, and, uh, and, and luckily for me, when I was 24, um, I had a cast on my arm for one reason or another. And I was writing home, I was living in another country, I was living in Ireland and I was writing home letters and I couldn't write anymore because I had the cast on my arm. So someone gave me a typewriter and that's actually why I started writing. I started writing because it was my escape um, for that anger and for that emotion and to be able to be compassionate to myself. So I think that's why I write the books I do because I want people to be show themselves compassion, but also make sure that they know where their boundaries are and that they know what they deserve, you know? Um, and especially with Switch, like this new book, I wanted, I want, I was so thrilled because my character, she may be in kind of like a messed up situation, but she knows who she is. She knows what to call what just happened to her. She knows to call it out. And she, but most importantly, she's proud of herself. And it was in a way, it's a mirror of myself. Like I won that beautiful gold medal and you got, y'all, I couldn't, I couldn't access pride. I was like, oh, this is wonderful. And it's, it sounds horrible because what a thing to get. Like, I didn't expect that call. I didn't expect any of that. I wrote a book. That was it. And then it went out in the world. And it's, you know, usual Amy book. It's weird. And people say it's weird. And, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, still have three other jobs. And that's what I have to do um, to, to do what I do. But like, I couldn't be proud. And so in the last year, I have found my pride. And it sure is nice after 51 years of being told, you're yeah, a girl, you can't really be proud like me. And I was, I look around, I'm like, what do you have to be proud of exactly? You, you were born with that thing. That's it. That's it. Like you, you were born the way you know, a man and that, that makes you, I don't know. I, it's just, it's just so weird living in this world as, as a woman. It's weird working in this world as a woman. And I just, I love that you say embracing your anger leads to compassion. It's true. And finally in the last year, I was able to do that and have compassion uh -huh. for myself. I do have a, I have a question for you. So like with Switch, did like, can you talk us through like what the book is about first? Um, and then how it relates to like everything that you've been exploring oh or does it relate? Oh, everything, thanks. Everything does, everything I write relates. So, and it's funny cause the sculpture that, that was made for the front of the book is a real, it shows you, you know, there's the house, it's upside down and I'm writing the house and I have the sculpture in my living room now and it's, uh, and I have lights behind it and it's on all 24 um, seven because I write the house. It took a while and it took a lot of tragedy, but um, not to say the tragedy was caused, whatever, but anyway, what's the book about? Well, I still can't describe it, but it's, it's basically a double barreled kind of, there's three things. First, time has stopped. Not like stopped, we're not all frozen, otherwise that would make a really crappy book because um, nothing could happen, but the clocks have stopped um, and uh, there's just no clock and no date. And so, um, and the government as usual gets involved and says, you know, well, um, the kids will, will, will save us. So everybody has to do a, a project in school, no matter what, whether you're in kindergarten or in grad school, everybody spends about an hour a day working on solution time to find a solution to, to basically earth falling into a fold in time and space. Um, and so our main character, Truda Becker, her solution for it is she thinks that, that getting out of a fold in time and space has something to do with giving a shit about people. Um, so it's psychology, which is where this comes in. And, and Robert Pletchik, who is a, uh, American psychologist from the 20th century. Um, and then the other side of it, which has to, more to do with the house and really more to do with the, the real meat of the story is that in Truda's house, there's a switch and uh, like a light switch on the wall. And um, she, no one knows what the switch controls. And so no one touches it. And, um, but then uh, her father uh, 
builds boxes around the switch um, just to keep the, everybody safe from the switch. And the minute he hides the switch, she wants to know what the hell the switch is. And then he builds bigger and bigger boxes. And as he builds the boxes, he's building out the whole house. He boxes up the entire house. It becomes a giant plywood box um, or series of boxes. Uh, to keep everyone safe and she has a, a an unnamed sister uh, who's in one box but who isn't really in the other it's a long story and a brother who's in another box and um the idea for her is that she has to figure out how to navigate this home this home world that, that is not a really good description at all and then there's the fact that she can also has this prize she throws the javelin she's on the track team she throws jav and um she can throw the javelin further than anyone. She believes that all the energy that she has from being denied her emotions and her life and everything and being kind of messed with her whole life um, is finally, now that she's freed them and have gotten compassion for herself, she puts that energy into the javelin and that's why it throws so far. How does that connect to me? Oh boy, there's a lot of things there that connect to me. Um, my, again, my household growing up my, my parents were very were very cool. They understood me. They they knew that I needed time alone. They knew I was independent. They knew I liked being creative. They uh, always um, they always really supported that creativity, which was cool. But I also had bad messaging always. Like you're not good enough. You're doing this wrong. You should dislike this person. You should do this. This is what you should do. I got shoulded from the minute I can remember. I don't think I was ever not shoulded. Um, everybody should shoulded me. Um, but more importantly. I wasn't allowed to be proud of things I did. Um, it was sort of like, especially like once this start, once my career started and I started to get published after 15 years of trying, like it was easy enough to be like, maybe mm, still writing books, so well, she's never gonna get published. I mean, it took me 15 years to get published from 24 to 40. So that was a bit of a journey, but it was great because they could all roll their eyes at me. So then it could be negative, right? It could be that negative judgmental garbage. And that was what I grew up in around, negative judgmental garbage. And so, that was easy but then when I got published and then when I started to like get success or, or whatever critical success at least um then it started to be like well I don't think you should have that character in that book and that's the shooters they would say that and I'd be like oh so now you have an opinion about what I'm doing that's interesting and then it started to become like uh-oh they're gonna they're gonna do whatever they can to break me they're gonna do whatever they can to make me small and to keep me small and um and then, you know, I can't even get into what happened in my life because it's just way too complicated and way too long right now. But they didn't succeed at that because here I am sitting right here in front of you. And that's what that in a way is what, what Truda's story is about. She gets to go out and throw that javelin and she almost quits track team because a few people are be like, tone it down. You're throwing too far. You're being too good. And she's like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. And then at the end, she's like, nah, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to go and throw this thing as far as I can over and over and over again. And that's kind of how I feel. And I, I do that. I did. I do that because I suffered great tragedy in the last few years of my life. I lost my, my teenage daughter and um, I don't wish that on anybody, not even my worst enemy. And in losing that teenage daughter, so many things happened in my life um, that were both good and beautiful. And I learned that humans are inherently good um, and that uh, all, in a way, all that shit that keeps me down, patriarchy, all of it, doesn't mean shit. As long as I have a nice, as long as I can move forward and live my life three times as hard because I'm living it for two now. Does that make sense? And that's kind of why I wrote this book too. This was the first book I wrote since I lost my daughter as well. So it was hard to actually get out of my, my body. So. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This one is it's like- cool, man. I love your dog already. <laughs> uh, like 200. That, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, but what I do want to talk about is emotions. Um, because I think that that's something that you and I both like connect on is emotions and the understand and, and the importance of harnessing your um, emotions. So like, how do you do that in your work and how does that inform your work? And I think you've touched on it a little bit, but yeah, it's, if it's you could big. go into detail, yeah, also, I'm going to step away and I'm listening. I'm just going to get this one a chew toy. Sounds good. All right, cool. Understood. And I, and, and give, give her a kiss for me. I like, I love your dog already. Um, so how do emotions, yeah, I mean, that's where everything starts. If I'm angry, that's the first, you know, I'll, I'll conceptualize it, put it into a surrealist lens and um, and then it becomes a story. So like I was angry at uh, the publishing world and I wrote this line and it was uh, Gustav is building a helicopter. 
and, and the helicopter is invisible and it's red, but you can see it on Tuesdays, which to me, when it comes to the publishing industry after this long in it, that's about as uh, the kind of enigma that the publishing industry is to me. And it's frustrating. And then I'm like, oh, I write young adult books. This has to be about something else, you know? So it's sort of like, I start with emotion every time, like emotions. And it's, it's kind of like, that's where it always was. I mean, I look back to my first novel again, typewritten, manic, like just unbelievable. Single space ran off the bottom of the paper, ran to the edges of the paper. It would, it would drive you kind of a little bit spare looking at it. But, um, uh, but I was escaping. So again, emotions, whether I'm, I'm, I'm diving right into them, but escaping the life where I wasn't allowed to have them. So um, there's that, you know, but I mean, I think a lot of it comes from curiosity about my own emotions too, and curiosity about other people's emotions. What about you? I'm going to flip it right back to you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to like conceive this answer. Um, I think that you and I are very similar in that we understand that um, one of the big ways in which people, like, people are gaslighted is when you're taught to, you can't feel this, this isn't appropriate, you can't feel that, that isn't appropriate, you know? Which means you then, you, you push it down, you push it down, you push it down, um, and, and uh, I, f I forget who said this. It was probably like a TV show um, where somebody said that like feelings like, this is a wrong analogy, but like feelings are like smelly garbage, right? Um, if you hide the smelly garbage um, under somewhere, um, that doesn't mean that it's gone away. It comes out in different um, ways. Your house ends up stinking. And that's the thing about emotions is that if you don't address them, you don't, you don't feel them, you don't, you don't express them when they are needed, then your house ends up stinking in some way, which oftentimes is a mental illness. Because like, um, to me, like, especially with like situational depression, um, certain forms of mental illness are because you are not addressing something that needs to be addressed. And it is your body like basically screaming at you from the rooftops that, hey, something is wrong. We need to fix this. And so for me, when I write, I oftentimes like to examine um, an emotion, right? And how it can be used against you or how it can be perverted. In The Gilded Ones, basically women are taught that you should be happy this is a paradise. You want to be here. This is, this is what is good for you. So like oftentimes women, literally in my world, like people wear African, women wear African masks to show their devotion to God and to their husbands. So every time they leave their house, they have to wear a mask. And oftentimes women wear a mask that is smiling because that is what is, that is what is, Mm -hmm. needed is that for a woman you must smile you must be happy um and so I just and also and this is the other thing so The Gilded Ones is a very feminist book and I think a lot of times when people hear the word feminism they mm -hmm. immediately think that it's against men oh yeah it's zero-sum game right it's a huh? zero-sum it's a zero-sum game yeah. to so many people it's ridiculous it's like if women move, if women move forward that means men move backwards and so for me, one like to circle back to that when you were talking about anger leads to compassion, for the longest time, I was angry at men. I was just like, y'all live in this world and you guys, you guys are the ones who like basically you are enjoying this world and we are not. And then the more I, I, I felt my emotions, the more I realized, wait a second, it's not all, it's not all cheery for boys either. Because just as we're taught to not be angry, they're taught that that's the only way is to be angry. So if you're sad, punch something. If you're, if you're feeling mad, punch something. If you're this, because that's what it means to be a man. And it is and it is very insidious the way that boys, especially little boys, are divorced from their emotions and like pulled away from it. Yeah. And that's something that um, 
because the Gilded Ones is a trilogy. So I sort of like start touching on it in book one, but we see it more in like the, we examine it more deeply in the other books where in this world, boys are taught that girls are inferior, boys are superior, but we must also prove that we are men and that we are this, that we are that. And so that gaslighting goes both ways. So like, if you have any feelings or whatever, you can't express them because that's not what men do. Yeah. Um, and so I, in this book, like just all through it, examine all the different sort of ways that we handle emotion and that we are taught that emotion is appropriate. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, I love what you were saying about feminism and how it, it doesn't serve, or it does, basically doesn't serve men. And I mean, this is, I'm right in the middle grade at the moment. And, and my middle grades become accidentally um, feminist, not accidentally. Everything I do is feminist because I'm a feminist. I've been a feminist my whole life. And, and it's amazing the reaction to that word. You're absolutely right. Like men are like, oh, feminists. I'm like, dude, feminism serves you. I move forward, you move forward. And so I'm writing this book and it's about, it's something about something so not related. It's about censorship. It's about, but it, it's a real story that happened in my daughter's um, then fifth grade class where the book was, uh, it was it's, it's a Holocaust book. So it's a, and it's a very serious scene where um, Nazi soldiers are in a shower uh, saying, you know, screaming, schnell, schnell uh, at these girls that have no clothes on in the shower. And as the girl turns around, um, this is a Jane Yellen book, by the way, Devil's Arithmetic, great book. Um, and she, so the showers go off, the, the guards are screaming, they're terrified, they're 12 and 13 year old girls. And she says, uh, it says something like, um, I turned around or I walked away covering, you know, covering my breasts. And that was sharpied out. And so was another line that referred to an undeveloped chest was sharpied out. And as I wrote this book, I realized, that was because, and I asked, I mean, obviously I've, I went and we had a lot of discussions and it was funny because no one really thought anything, anything, oh, it's not a big deal, Amy, just because just you're an author. I'm like, no, this is intellectual freedom and you can't cross out words in books. But more importantly, why did you cross out these words? Well, the boys will giggle. <gasps> you think so little of boys that you think they're going to giggle during a Holocaust shower scene at the word breast. A, it's your job to model adult behavior at that point in your classroom. I'm sorry. I love teachers. I come from a family of teachers, but that is your job. Um, B, how little do you think of boys? How much do you need feminism? You need feminism in a huge way. You have such internalized misogyny, female teacher, to think that boys have to be protected from the word breast. Again, if it wasn't for breast, they wouldn't even be here. What are we doing? This doesn't make any sense. But yeah, feminism absolutely serves men. And, it's, and, and it allows them, like, it gives them feelings and stuff. I mean, again, I go back to, to my experience for 30 years with a very angry uh, very angry, very confused, very, um, a very angry man. That's all he had. That's all he could access was anger at everything. I never saw anybody so angry at breakfast, uh, like just, you know, waking up, uh, you know, and I'd say, hey, let's talk about this. <laughs> okay, let's not talk about that. But there's a problem with this thing. <laughs> okay, well, okay. You know, it's just, if you explode enough times, she'll shut up. What kind of life is that for a man? That's not a nice life. He should, he, men should be allowed to have full, beautiful, emotional lives where they are soft and they can grieve and they can cry and they can dance and they can act goofy as hell and not be cool all the time. Like, and that's what feminism is. They just, sadly, you know, it's, I guess it's, it gets, gets a bad rap, same with socialism, um, even though we all like our highways. I think we have about three minutes left. Does anybody yep. have a question that they can like pop in the chat? Um, I do think that I saw one question. Yes. Um, let's see. I think and it was it, for you, Namina. Uh, it, it, um, yeah. Have you mentored young? Uh, da, da, da. Um, it's funny. Uh, I, I do very informal mentorship in that um, I just sort of take people under my wing and I like call them up. Like I'm very good at calling pe people up and being like, what are you up to? What are you doing? Tell me about what's been going on in your life. Oh, it seems like you're doing too much. Let's talk about this. Like, so I just, I informally mentor a lot of people, but um, in terms of a formal mentorship, no. It's a busy life. <laughs> it it's is a busy, busy life. And yeah. I mean, the, the bonuses as, as the one, the coolest thing about this job, and uh, you know, I didn't know what it would be because I love the creativity. I love the writing, but man, getting out and I miss it after this quarantine getting into actual schools. And I mean, Rochester is a place I sometimes spend an entire week going from school to school. 
um, getting into schools, getting on those stages and talking directly to young people about exactly what we talked about today. And I do talk about a lot of the stuff we talked about today. I get I get into it and because you know why? I leave at three o'clock. Go ahead, chase me in my car. What are you going to do? Arrest me for saying the truth to your kids? No. So I talk about trauma. I talk about all this stuff and I, I get into to that exact thing and just the smelly garbage as yeah. you know, as we yeah. talked about. And it's not a one-on-one -on -one mentorship at all, but it is a cool thing to suddenly get a letter like seven years later. Because I always say to the audience, you might think I'm boring today, but in about 10 years, this might mean something to you. And I get a letter every now and again. It's like, oh man, Ms. King, <laughs> you know, that thing you said, it, it hit me, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm always glad that it does. So, I mean, just in writing books, you're mentoring thousands and thousands and thousands of people, especially a book like that. I cannot wait to read it. Now I'm going to same. I you like pick up all your books, like all of them. There's a lot of them. Just take your time. They're not going anywhere. It's all fine. <laughs> it's all good. One minute left. Do you have like any last thoughts for people um, that you want to share? Yeah, I do. Um, when it comes to this topic, don't be afraid to be yourself. And if you're a creative person, don't be afraid to pour yourself in. You don't have to. If you're writing stories, and we always get a lot of writers here at TBF, young writers, don't think you need to tell me a story that's cute and fits onto whatever screen. Tell me a story that makes you want to sit down and not move your body except your fingers for hours. Tell me a story that, that comes out of you, that helps you. Not therapy as much as sharing, right? And sharing your experience. And yeah, make it a metaphor, make it cool, you know? But don't be afraid to share yourself. And many times you've been told to shut up. I want to be here to like be standing right in front of that person telling you to shut up or shut up your feelings and say, mm -mm, no, they're wrong. You're right. Keep going. Do what you feel. What about you, Namina? Um, I think the first thing I will say is be honestly um, 100% yourself and claim who you are. Um, as you grow up, like people will always have a box to put you in, especially when you're a teenager. People are searching for boxes. You're like this, therefore you are this person. You're like this, therefore you are this person. So I would say claim yourself. Be 100% aggressively who you are. Like, I often, like, I, I'm just going to tell y'all, like, I am turning into a caricature of myself, and I love it. Like, the older I get, the more, like, the more foolish I become. And, like, I just, I gleefully don't care because I'm like, you know, this is who I am. I'm, I am sort of silly. Uh, I'm, I'm basically, I think basically I'm a Persian cat in a human body, even though I don't like Persians but like that's who I am and I'm becoming more ridiculously that way as I grow up and that's fine. So be your most, whoever you are, be your, whoever you are, be your most ridiculous self, the self that you wanna be, not the self that people tell you that you should be because people will always, always, always um, have something that they wanna tell you about who you should be and oftentimes it's not to your benefit. So please, 100% be yourself, ridiculousities and all. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. And Namina, you just made, you just inspired the crap out of me. I'm an old lady at this point and you inspired me to just keep being goofy. So thank you so much. It was really nice meeting you at TBF. I always meet new friends. I've been here like 11 times and I, it's my favorite festival on earth. And so I'm so happy to meet you today. So that was a real honor. You're wonderful. I am so happy to meet you. You are an inspiration to me as well. I am now going to go seek out all your books. <laughs> Take it easy. Have a great rest of your day. And thanks, guys. Go and find other panels and do other things. These guys can tell you where to go. And you know where. If you're here, you know how to find the information. Thank you for joining us today. You're fantastic. Have a great day. Thank you both so much. That was amazing.